about a little bit about what to do. Thank you very much. Good evening to everybody. You probably have to speak up quite loud. I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, organizer, for this opportunity of sharing with you some reflections on the Brazilian experience. It's quite a responsibility that after hearing you about my country, but I'll try to in five minutes to give you some highlights of the experience. I've been asked to pick up some lessons learned from the Brazilian experience. First of all, most of what you will hear in here is the result of a social process or a process of social construction, construction that's been developed in, in on for some 20 years now. And this is an outcome of the book because all this started at the end of the military group. So, democracy is a key element in the Brazilian experience. Uh, it's important to insist that in this. I mean, you don't miss democracy here in your country. I think you can do a little bit better. <laughs> we, can do, we can all do a little bit better. But uh, this is quite important because the Brazilian experience has been transferred to many countries. And as the democratic debate, the open debate around the issue, giving visibility to contradictions, different bills, and depending on where you are, trying to reach an agreement around the topics in terms of political policy, is an essential element. And this is not transferable. So sometimes this is the missing part of the policy transfer. Second is building this sort of intersectorial and participatory approach. The participatory means that all this construction is, has been done with a strong participation of civil society organization in different ways. I myself, as I mentioned, I was part of the network and also a member of the council and for us. So, this is one pillar of the Brazilian experience, which has to do with social participation in the very making of policies and implementing also the monitoring and control, social control. The other pillar is having this intersectorial spaces. I'm talking about the government. So, the council has 40 members from civil society and 20 ministers. From different sectors. These 20 ministries, ministries they got together in the interministerial chamber to deal with food and nutrition security. And then this is a governmental space where they take or not powerful positions. But the, the most important aspect of it, of it is this trying to have this intersectorial dialogue. You certainly realize that this is not the story of the strong and powerful Brazilian Army business. I'm not talking about them. Another story. They are part of the course of what we discussing of the system. They are, they are just the other reserve. We've got lots of reserves. So I'm talking about one part of it, which is the one I, I think I belong. And I tried to. The second is that this idea of having multi, a multi-dimensional view on food and poverty means that there is no silver bullet in the stock. And this is perhaps is one of the most important lessons learned in the experience, is that making use of a bunch of problems. Although you can identify one or two that could be, the, for instance, the cash transfer program, etc. But if we, if we didn't have, especially during the Lula's government, a strong counter cyclical policy in the middle of the crisis, creating jobs and recovering the real value of the minimum wage, we will be able to see as we did in terms of poverty and, and hunger. The other is has to do with, with the institutional framework. We've, in our experience, it's been quite important translating at least the main parts of it in terms of law. 
in Brazil, I mean, as in most in many countries of the world, I mean, you, it, it's not enough having the law. You can have the law, but just not pay attention. To that. But uh, it's been important because it, for the first time we have a definition of fundamental security and the, the law, the, the right to food in the constitution, etc. And this helps in pushing the, 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 the getting some compromise from governments and also from the society. The other aspect is has to do with the launching of some innovative programs. One of one of these innovations that are my uh, that I most mentioned has to do with this idea, which is quite intersectorial. Perhaps it's the most important intersectorial product that we created in 2003, which made mainly the access to to food from from poor families and creating market for small producers and poor producers. This idea of using the food procurement to promote at the same time access and production, kind of production, not production, production coming from family farmers or small, small farmers. This was the very beginning of this integrated field. But in this case, there is an important aspect that at that time it, it was necessary to have a program that <coughs> was against the law, in which sense. Because, as probably in many parts of the world, food procurement and the, the use of food research, of public research, is based in a false assumption that you have to treat all equally. When you treat equally, when you treat unequals equally, what you're doing is promoting inequality. And I came from one of the most unequal countries in the world. So this program that I just mentioned, and everybody takes it as a normal success, etc. At that time, at that moment, it, it's, it, it, it meant that we have to, to disobey the law in order to say, this public resource will be used for this purpose. So we are going to, the government will take the money that he used to catch, he used to use for buying food, and we shall normally capture by large companies and say, no, there is, in this public offer here, is a, a, we are going to organize the public offer in a way that we will prioritize this sector. And this is against the idea of <coughs> treating equally everybody. Now he's treating unequally the unequals in order to promote a little bit more of equality. And this idea was was uh, uh, used in the reframing of the school new program that has been already mentioned. The school new program result is the, the, the oldest one we have. It, it's got about 50 years now. But for 20 years, it became a program with its own budget, budget. And it's been reformulated in 2009 with a strong social participation need. And then this idea of buying local food, in this case for schools, it, it gains a, a, a nationwide uh, uh, presence because the program is uh, the, the school new program. It, it's present in 5,500 municipalities. And it's a free school. I think it's the biggest, the largest free school new program in the world. It's 46 million meals a day. And for, I think I've got already, I wish already the, the five minutes. Just make me, just let me make the uh, last point of our experience. I've been talking about social participation. One important aspect is that. For, for giving some effectiveness to the social participation, quite important. The civil society is able to, uh, to have some autonomy and have some autonomous organization in order to be better prepared to influence both points. So, this idea of having the network of civil society and combining the, the ways of dialogue 
with government. We are, in our in the case of the Council, our mission is promoting the dialogue between government and civil society by giving visibility to different fields, from tradition and conflicts, and trying to reach an agreement. But this is not all the civil society <coughs> do. The social movements, especially, they do pressure. They go to streets. So the idea is combining the way. We can have very nice people in the government. But I have an author that I like most that says that the best situation is having good people in government surrounded by good pressures. And that's the way the integrated view is constructed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.